on the next show, Grooming with Lucian. Is it possible to keep your beard both smooth and manageable during the hurricane? Okay. It is not a hurricane. It is a quarantine. And what is the difference? Oh, that is a quarantine. We're under one of those right now? Really? Good to know. Forget all that. Is it possible to keep your beard both smooth and manageable during the quarantine? N not the hurricane. That is something else entirely. We are under a quarantine. Very, very serious. But tune into the next show. I'll let you know. Welcome to Adult Story Time with Lucian. That's another show. It sounds interesting, though. I should see that show. <clears throat> what was it? <laughs> okay, never mind. Uh, where are we? Yes, what are we doing? Uh, hmm. I need to bring, where is my book? There it is, right there. Oh, that's what I was going to do. I forgot. See, the commercial got me all thing. I was bringing in my new thing. Tonight's story is The God in the Clear Rock, written and read by Lucian. Of course, I'm Lucian, so <laughs> you knew that already. All right. See, this is what happens. Quarantine's cabin fever. You start going crazy, you've got time to do anything. So I sit in here and I play with this. I make graphics and computer animations and... Oh. oh well, okay, let's see how we doing. The recording looks good. Upstream wasn't looking good there for a little bit. It was redlining. I don't know what's going on with the uplink. I'm going to have to get my own satellite truck, I guess. All right, let's bring up our timer. Get right to it. Oh, the timer's running. Who knew? We'll stop that now. Reset it. There we go. All right. I'm not even going to ask if you remember where we are, because you know I'm just going to read it anyway, so I'm going to do that. The two archaeologists looked at each other for a second as they both breathed in the fresh air from the small duct. On an unspoken mark, they crawled over to the pedestal together. That's where we were. All right, I'm going to step in closer. Make sure. There we go. See, just giant head time tonight. All right, ready? Timer away. Timer is rolling. There we go. Is the story exciting yet? This is an exciting part. Pay attention. Marise slipped off the small backpack she wore and pulled out a Sten lamp. She unfolded the legs on the lithium-ion battery and extended the pole with the LED head. She switched it on and then placed it near the pedestal and pointed the floodlight at the side and top. Jacinto mirrored her on his side. Then they both pulled out small brushes and leaned in to look closely at the carved stone box with their headlamps. The pedestal was covered with the same strange three-dimensional relief carvings and the same unknown glyphs. Marise was starting to recognize the glyphs, but she still had no idea what they meant. These glyphs appeared nowhere else in all of the Mayan writing known to man, which wasn't a whole lot of writing to begin with. That's why, excuse me, that's why the unknown glyphs didn't worry her all that much. Not right now. Although the fundamentals of the Mayan language had been deciphered, the full, diverse writing that existed during the actual reign of the Mayans was just starting to be understood. Just a second. There we go. Not getting enough audio. There we go. Of the Mayans was just starting to be understood. The current level of knowledge came from only a handful of documents that survived the Spanish Christian purge of the Mayan kingdom and was actually not much more than a beginner level. As more examples of ancient Mayan writing were discovered, new glyphs were expected. Hey boss! That, on the other hand, was unexpected, Marise thought to herself as she looked up from the spot she had been inspecting. Jacinto had his head below the edge of the carved top, 
on the other side of the pedestal. When he stuck his head up, he actually looked excited, unlike how he looked when Marise had informed him that they were about to climb into the hole and crawl into the mountain. He wasn't excited at all then, but now Jacinto had a grin that went from ear to ear. You're not going to believe this. Did you bring that piece of rock from between the legs of our creepy crawler outside? Marise slid around the pedestal to him. Then she reached into the pocket on her shorts and retrieved the curved stone. Jacinto pointed to a spot near the top edge of the carved pedestal. As both of their headlamps and hand lights converged on the stone top, the hole in the carving glared out at them. Marise reached out with the rock and held it in front of the hole. It obviously goes right here, she thought to herself. She could see how the curves matched perfectly, but she couldn't get it into the place where it went. She pulled it back and slid forward to look closely at the rock carving. Then she leaned down and looked under the broken section. Suddenly, she popped her head up and then snapped it toward Jacinto. There's a seam under here. This is a top. The piece broke off before they finished putting it on. That's why it won't fit in now. She quickly crawled back over to the other side and grabbed the top of the pedestal. Let's see if we can budge this thing. Don't you want to take pictures first? She knew that she should. But first, she wanted to see if they needed more equipment. Nah, let's just see if we can move it. We can document everything in a minute. Then she stood up and bent at the waist over the edge of the pedestal top. Jacinto carefully bent over the top opposite her. They had practiced picking things up together many times. It only made sense that an archaeology field team would be able to move large, heavy items with only their bodies and leverage, which was what they used now. On the count of three, they grunted and lifted up on the stone cover. It moved up and slid to the side just enough to catch the edge and not slip back down. They both suddenly thought there had to be something under this top. Otherwise, why would they have put it here? As they rested for a moment and leaned their weight against the pedestal, Marise had a follow-up thought. This thing is too big to move it in here. They had to build this room around this box. Well... Hopefully that means something valuable is inside, snapped Jacinto. Come on, let's get it open. Marise smiled as she got into position again. This time they grunted after the count, and the heavy top slid about a foot and a half to the side with the grating sound of stone on stone. When they both relaxed for the rest interval, they looked over and saw a deep opening in the smooth pedestal underneath the sliding cover. The lights from their headlamps threw a dark set of shadows into the rectangular hole's interior. Then they both got the same idea at the same time. They leaned forward and pointed their headlamps into the hole. The bluish-white light from the low-energy bulbs shone over the dark carved mahogany of the box like pale sunlight from a pair of miniature stars. It was the first light to touch the box in almost five centuries. Marise slid over in front of the opening. She put her hands on the edge of the stone top, then pushed her weight in, into it with her legs, and the top slid another six inches to the side. Then she leaned over the table and gingerly reached inside the hole with her flashlight. She quickly looked around the edges with the LED light and her headlamp. After she was satisfied with the inspection, she put the pen light into her mouth and reached into the hole placing her hands on the sides of the mysterious wooden box. She gently curled her fingers under the edge of the intricate carving without touching the stone sides of the hole's interior. Slowly, she began to lift the box, and then she stopped and listened. Then she repeated this process. Up several millimeters, stop, listen, repeat. After a few minutes, the box was clear of the surface of the pedestal. Jacinto took his flashlight, and like the coordinated efforts of a bomb squad, he examined the underside of the box and the bottom of the hole while Marise held it steady. When he finished, he shook his head from side to side. 
Looks clean. No booby traps. Then he smiled at her. I wonder who thought up that name. Booby trap. That's funny when you think about it. Marty said carefully moved the box to the top of the smooth pedestal that had been created specifically to hold it. She pulled the flashlight out of her mouth and began to look closely at the box as she answered him. Probably some booby who didn't have boobies. Then she leaned in and looked closely at one of the corners of the box. This is one solid piece of wood. There's no joinery in the corners. She sat up for a second as she thought about something. Then she turned off her flashlight and stuck it back in its belt case. She grabbed the corners of the wooden case and lifted the cover straight up and off. She quickly looked at the top and bottom of the mahogany cover with her headlamp. Jacinto didn't move. Marise carefully set the wooden cover on the pedestal top beside the lower half. Inside the bottom of the bottom mahogany box was a beautiful and intricately patterned cloth of exceedingly delicate thread. Marise reached into the other pocket on her shorts and pulled out a fresh pair of cotton gloves. She and Jacinto had both used another clean pair when they handled and moved the warrior priest's body outside the 25 meter long tunnel into this eight-sided chamber. She carefully lifted the cloth as Jacinto moved, in, moved the stin lamps over to shine on the box interior. Underneath the beautiful and mysterious, clo mysterious cloth was a clear crystal looking sheet. No, make that a plate or a tablet thought Marise as she opened both edges of the multicolored cloth to reveal the entire artifact. In the lights from the multiple LED flood heads, the tablet-shaped crystal plate reflected thousands of tiny prisms of light. Marise leaned in to look closely, but her headlamp reflected off the shiny crystal surface and back into her eyes, momentarily blinding her. She quickly reached up and switched her headlamp off. When she looked back at the box, she could see what made the prisms of light bounce off the shiny surface of the artifact. Marise saw what looked like tiny engraved glyphs and writing of some sort in the intense glow of the artificial floodlights. Suddenly, her eyes got wide as she quickly glanced over the entire surface of the unbelievable plate of whatever the hell it was. She retrieved her flashlight again, then looked through the clear plate to the bottom of the case. There was nothing else in the box, which she could see had been carved out of a single piece of mahogany and was meant to hold just one thing, this artifact. She looked at the hole in the pedestal and realized the rock interior was custom carved to hold just one thing also, the box with the artifact inside of it. She turned back to the bottom half of the dark mahogany case as she slowly reached in and grabbed the glass plate by the outside edges of what appeared to be the sides. The area that appeared to be the top was slightly bowed upward. The other three sides were perfectly straight. The tablet shaped artifact was almost two feet wide. The width to height ratio was about the same as a large widescreen computer monitor. The long straight side looked like it should be the bottom if you leaned it against something or hung it on a wall. This odd shape made Marise curious as she lifted it out and held it up to the LED lights. Then she peered closely at the mysterious plate of glass and wondered out loud, what the hell is this thing? Jacinto had been trying to pick his jaw up off the floor the whole time. He finally succeeded in speaking. Wow. That ended his tirade. Marise barely noticed him, but kept talking to herself. The writing looks engraved, but how is that possible? She shifted the heavy artifact in her hands and held another section in front of the LED stin lamps as she looked closely at the engravings. Around the perimeter of the flat surface were blocks of different types of incredibly tiny carved glyphs, but the type of writing appeared to be 
the same in each different block. She moved the bottom of the artifact up into the light. The engravings at the bottom center looked utterly foreign to her. They looked like icons or runes. Maybe it was just artistic doodles, she thought as she finally looked at the large center of the thick plate glass. In the very middle was an engraved drawing of the sun. It was unmistakable what the image was intended to be. The almost perfect circular image had stylized solar rays all around the edge, as the sun was universally drawn by all primitive civilizations and children. The entire plate looked like a picture of the sun with captions all around. But the sun had a few strange rays that stuck out on one side of the sun image. These stylized arms reached out much farther than any of the other rays coming off the iconic sun image. They looked remarkably like a massive solar explosion or some type of ultrasolar flare. Matisse quickly passed up the sun image and returned to the top center block of glyphs. This is definitely Mayan writing up here, but it has those same damn mystery glyphs which are all over this place. Jacinto slid in closer to see what she was talking about, but he just stared at the artifact. Matisse didn't notice him and kept talking out loud to herself. That block to the right of the Mayan glyphs is strange, though. It almost looks Olmec. She stopped talking and leaned in closer to this section now. Whoa. It has those same shaped glyphs as these unknown Mayan ones. This got Jacinto's attention. He decided to join the one-sided conversation. Maybe it's an interim Mayan Olmec mix. Look at the block to the right of that one, boss. That is classic Olmec writing. Marisa immediately saw that her, her, her assistant was correct. Nice catch, Hasi. Okay, you're off the hook for the sword tip thing. She suddenly stopped talking again in mid-sentence and tilted her head slightly. Then, just as abruptly, she started, talk, started up again. Look, the Olmet block has the same strange glyphs. She quickly glanced at the other two blocks. And they're in the same place in each block set. She lowered the panel back onto the box, but set it candy corner, catty corner, and kept it in the light while she rested her arms. Jacinto leaned over and stuck his face into the glassy engraved surface. When he spoke, he turned his head to the side, or turned his head to look at Marise and tried not to breathe on it. Whatever it is, it doesn't look like typical royal dynasty records. We'll stop there. Okay, there we go. All right. So, all right, I hope you guys are having a good time. You see, I have to keep asking that you guys are having a good time because if I was telling you an actual bedtime story, I could look at your happy little faces and know that you were having a good time. But since I can't actually see your, actually I can see your faces, but they tell me not to say that. The NSA says I shouldn't tell you that because it makes you nervous. So I, I can't really see your faces. Let's go with that, okay? So what you need to do is like, you know, leave a comment or a heart or something on one of the Periscope or YouTube or whatever so I know. All right, that's it. I will see you guys on the next one. Oops, that was not. There we go. Just the facts, ma'am.
tonight's show was brought to you by Grooming with Lucian. <laughs>